The Wild Rose Agricultural Producers, also known as RAP, held their 2013 Annual General Meeting in Banff, Alberta in early January. The theme of the meeting was sharing the vision of agriculture and featured numerous guest speakers including a special keynote address by agricultural journalist and commentator Wendy Holm. RAP is pleased to share a vision of agriculture from Wendy Holm. resource economist, agrologist, author, and journalist. Wendy has covered stories at the forefront of Canadian policy since the early 1990s, picking up seven national journalism awards since 2003. She's a UBC lecturer and distinguished, distinguished alumni. Holmes is a powerful communicator on issues as diverse as food and resource policy, governance, cooperative economics, sustainable communities, international engagement, globalization, and international cooperation. So I'd like everybody to give Wendy a, a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to Paul and the cooperators for sponsoring um, my talk today. Thank you to the conference organizers for bringing me here today. I love being in rooms with farmers. That's my favorite thing to do. Um, and we're taping this to send it to Stephen, by the way. This conference calls on all of us to share our vision on the future of agriculture. And I've been asked to kick things off by speaking to you about food farming and public policy, why food security and sovereignty are essential to a sustainable future for Canada, and what policy respect looks like uh, for our farmers. Uh, in the conference materials, uh, your premier shared her vision of an agriculture sector that supports the provincial economy through improved access to global markets. Your agriculture minister shared his vision of agriculture as a continuing pillar of rural communities, fostering innovation and entrepreneurship, and sustaining their economic, environmental, and social fabric of rural life. And I must say, I have a lot of time for that one. Um, I suspect most of you in this room would add to those statements that you want to receive a healthy farm return that supports the soils and future generations, that you want to continue to make independent management decisions, not be told how to farm, that you want to transfer the farm to the next generation and have the next generation ready and eager to do that, that you want to uh, stand together as farmers when it matters, and uh, that means understanding and supporting each other's concerns. And you want to feel pride in your community and be a respected part of your community. You also want to have a life. Uh, farming, I think, is about everybody pitching in and, and when the work's all done, spending time together as a family, um, taking a holiday once in a while, uh, maybe going with Wendy on a farm tour to Cuba this February, for example. I'm around till tomorrow, talk to me. <laughs> Um, my job here today is to plant seeds and uh, ideas that will hopefully take root and help spark further thought as you enter into discussions over the next day and a half and beyond. So how do we get to that healthy farm sector we know is essential for a sustainable food future? That's the question. There really couldn't be a better time to have this discussion. On the one hand, economists do this all the time, on the one hand, we face some very serious concerns and on the other hand, we have some very unique opportunities. The pump is completely primed, as the bumper sticker on my pickup says, farmers feed communities. I'm going to show you a couple of slides now, and I'm going to ask you if you know what that one is. Nope. <laughs> OK, does that help? <laughs> this, was, um, this was the uh, uh, volcano that uh, grounded flights in Europe and closed airports and Londoners for the first time, I think probably since World War II, had to measure their food security in days. Um, going quickly along um, the effects of um, climate change and temperature variable rainfall uh, is very well documented. I like this one, the US military warned oil output uh, may reach $100 a barrel by 2015. Well, <laughs> I think we're there. Uh, already, and the environmental food crisis, the UN uh, Environment Program says 25% loss in food production due to climate change, water scarcity, uh, invasive pests, and land degradation. This is the human population over the past two millennia. I'm sure you've all seen it. Um, 1800 is the tick before the, the last one, and um, that's what's happening on that side. The additional, uh, the additional one, of course, is issues of food safety. 
uh, food safety have uh, the, the numbers of concerns with foods that are uh, cause problems to people's health, uh, have toxins and, and adulterants uh, has gone up dramatically in the last uh, 10 years and this all has raised uh, concerns to consumers. The Canadian consumer has never before been so aware of food. Food safety, food sovereignty, food security, food democracy, food sustainability, local food, food in cities, urban agriculture, organic food, non-GMO labeling, ethical. It's hard to pick up a magazine or a newspaper day without seeing at least one of these terms in discussion, and that's a dramatic shift from a decade ago, and that presents a huge opportunity. We haven't found a way to produce food without the farmer. Vertical farms notwithstanding, farmers will remain central to food production. The question is, who calls the shots? As Lynn said this morning, who will control our food supply? Is the farmer the independent decision maker? Or are his decisions increasingly being influenced by others? Is the farmer the tool of capital? Or is capital the tool of the farmer? Only the latter is sustainable. The challenge is to leverage today's unprecedented public awareness of food issues into broad-based support and respect for Canada's farmers, and then leverage this politically to deliver the policy support needed for a sustainable future. Before talking about what policy respect looks like, I want to take you through a little bit of a history to put this all in context. So back in the feudal days, <laughs> the 9th to 15th century, farmers didn't own their land. They worked it at the pleasure of powerful lords, basically swapping food and loyalty for protection and sustenance. Most were indentured serfs, the more fortunate were sharecroppers, an arrangement where the peasant paid a share of his crop for rent. The farmers around the city of Bologna, Italy, who supplied silk to the mills were sharecroppers. The equity of these early arrangements is considered one of the reasons why the Emilia-Romagna region of northern Italy developed into such a strong and vibrant cooperative economy because of those early farming roots. Then came the Crusades and the lure of exotic goods and the rise of mercantilism. Suddenly, the lords needed more than food, they needed money to buy goods, which they learned they needed. So what they did was they got rid of the serfs and the sharecroppers, and uh, this is a shot in England, they enclosed their lands and they went to crops that they could produce themselves that would give them money. And so uh, in this case, uh, wool and meat could be sold for cash and the peasants were displaced into the city to look for work. About the same time, there was an energy race on to replace depleted wood supplies with coal. The problem was that the Coal mines, as they went deeper and deeper to get the coal, flooded with water. What to do? Um, to get the coal, they had to get the water out of the mines, and that led to the development of the steam engine. So cheap labor in the cities, more accessible supplies of coal, the rise of rail and ship transport, and the adaption of the steam engine to industrial processes created the perfect storm, and the Industrial Revolution was born. The race for profits was on. Without standards, however, regulating goods offered for sale problems soon developed. Flour laced with chalk, bags of coal containing rocks. The buyer was never sure what exactly they were getting, nor if it was safe. Without standards regulating labor practices, workers were forced to work long hours in poor conditions for low wages. So in response, and I love both of these etchings, cooperatives began springing up to provide people with unadulterated goods at fair prices and introduce equity into the workplace. And you've heard, I know, the name Robert Owen and William King and others who were the early pioneers in this. Only 20 years after the Rochdale pioneers opened their cooperative, that's in, 19, in 1863, 20 years later, the New England Cooperative Society was launched by 300 individual co-ops. In 20 years from Rochdale, there were 300 co-ops spread out throughout England. The late 19th century co-op societies continued to be the mainstay of many communities. Many still exist today as members of the Cooperative Group UK. The cooperative principles developed by England's Rochdale Society of Equitable Pioneers in 1844 continue to form the foundation of today's co-op movement. Fast forward, <clears throat> Second World War and consumerism. The advent of television brought advertising into the home, equating happiness with consumption. And small businesses popped up all over the place to serve a society eager to try this new brand of happiness which put the war behind them. 
Small firms and their adolescents on Main Street are, are uh, good players. They're competitive, they're entrepreneurial, they're market responsive, just exactly like Adam Smith told us. But to grow, these firms needed capital, and that meant generating enough profit to attract investors. Only two ways to do that, either lower costs or increase revenues. Both were pursued, but the increased competition that came from swimming in a larger market became costly. So, as capitalist firms pursued a strategy of buying up or knocking off the competition, markets became concentrated. Everything that Adam Smith talked about in the benefits of competition started to ebb away. Chafing against the strictures of government regulation, the tiny drumbeat of a handful of University of Chicago academics led by Melton Friedman became the new marching song of capitalists telling government to get out of the way and let the markets decide. And the premise here is that greed, which um, some of the neoclassicists consider the human condition, creates the need for capital. And the supposition is that capital will bring together factors of production, labor, resources, technology to produce a profit. And this will create jobs. Of course, jobs are just a byproduct of profit. And as we've seen, the jobs can often disappear. The worker doesn't own what they produce, but the ideas or widgets ownership lies with the capitalist who pays the worker a wage for their service. Until the mid-1980s, the reach of capitalism was kept in check by nationalism. The belief that a nation had a sovereign right to run its economy to meet the needs of its people, basically that economy was a tool of society, not that society was a tool of the economy. But by the mid-1980s, multinational corporations were flexing their muscles on a global scale and governments were again pressured to deregulate. Now the focus was to eliminate policy instruments that impeded international mobility of capital Gave lo and, or that gave local producers or firms an advantage over international suppliers. And so tariffs, subsidies, national purchasing policies, and foreign investment regulations all went on the chopping block. With the concurrent dumbing down of competition legislation, market concentration moved from levels that were mildly disruptive to levels that are toxic for many communities, farming included. Gurus who 20 years ago said the deregulated market economy was a good national strategy are now espousing globalism. In an ideological Chinese finger trap, their choice is to recant or go forward. Because fed a diet rich in deregulation, the horses have already jumped the fences. Thanks to capital mobility and labor price disparities, there are few national boundaries left. Globalization is upon us. Today, many global brands make no tangible goods. Production is outsourced to subcontractors in regions with low environmental and labor standards. <clears throat> and these uh, subcontractors are called swallows because they establish their production center in mobile premises and then they just pick up and move to the next country with cheaper and lower environmental regulations. The 20, oh, 2008 fiscal meltdown in the subprime market uh, that caused global economic collapse was driven by this same greed that was so, uh, so espoused as the solution. Uh, back in the 80s. And five years down the road, we still haven't recovered. So the relevant question today really is, who owns the fruits of your labor? The worker, producer, or the capitalist that pays a salary or otherwise controls the profit margins through contracts and market concentration? When you think about it, today is not all that much different, really, from the 13th century feudalism. Global capitalists have indentured farmers in many countries through market power to produce a steady stream of goods to sustain their wealth. Why pay local farmers to produce milk when you can mass produce it, take out the water, ship derivatives to production plants all over the world as long as energy remains cheap? And if energy costs rise, well, as long as you've got control of the market, you just rise your, raise your prices along with that. If farmers don't remain independent and free of influence from big capital, their decision making will be owned by that capital. For society, today's critical question must be who will control our food supply? Against that backdrop, let's get back to farming and look at some of the ways policy needs to change to support a vision that's sustainable for the sector and for our nation. I've been a practicing agrologist since 1974, and um, my bio says 35, I guess that's getting on to 40 years. And uh, I can remember always saying back in the, in the 70s that um, Canadian farm policy is based on having independent producers provided with good information, making independent individual good decisions, and that collective effect of those individual good farm management decisions will result in a healthy agriculture sector. 
So the 20th century, the first, first uh, 80 years, was uh, characterized by respect for farming. And in the mid-1980s, everything began to change. We had uh, a loss of regulatory and policy sovereignty. GATT went to WTO. We have FTA and NAFTA. Weakening of the Competition Act. Uh, increase in market competition pre and post farm gate. Beef, hogs, grain, dairy, you name it, they're all uh, affected. Erosion of local infrastructure, drop in farm policy support, loss of domestic market share, and escalating feed and fertilizer prices. In 1991, uh, the GATT round, uh, the Uruguay round, Uruguay round of the GATT uh, was stuck and it looked like it was going to fail. And uh, the director general, a man named Dunkel, produced a draft called the Dunkel Draft, which uh, purported to um, sort subsidies into red subsidies, green subsidies, yellow subsidies. And um, the premise was that if you have subsidies which distort farm decision making, in other words, if you put a subsidy on potatoes, so I'm going to farm potatoes because I'm going to farm that subsidy, that rather than follow the market, that's not necessarily good farm management. So you want to create ways to support agriculture to uh, ensure them against the risk of markets and weather which are beyond their control to make sure that they're sustainable, but to free up good farm decision making. And so the, um, the premise was that, that, uh, that this was the way to do it, Dunkel said, and everybody uh, agreed, and this became the basis for the WTO. And you know, just a little comment on subsidy. I mean, we subsidize education, we subsidize medicine, we subsidize transportation, we subsidize the oil and gas sector, we subsidize the auto industry. Subsidies for farmers to mitigate market and climate risk is part of good public policy. Let me show you what happened um, as a result of these changes and cuts to farm support. What, what the other nations of the world did was get rid of red box subsidies and convert them to green. What Canada did was cut its subsidies faster or sharper than any other nation, except for Australia and uh, New Zealand. The, there was a 36% drop in farm support as a percentage of farm income over the past 20 years. And always you will see Canada in the orange and the red. So the orange is 86 to 88, and the red is 2005 to 2006. In Canada, support is 23% of farm gate returns. It wasn't in, in 2006. I have to update these stats, and I wanted to throw them in because I think they're really important. In the OECD, it's 30%, and the EU, 32%. Support cuts to Canadian farmers were twice the OECD average, 38% in, to Canada farmers in the past 20 years, compared to 28% for OECD and 21% for EU. So let me say that one more time. Support cuts to Canadian farmers were twice as severe as those to your competitors. Canadian farmer contribution to the GDP, however, remained steady. Uh, it dropped 57% in the EU. And Canada's support as a percentage of GDP is among the lowest in the OECD nations. Canada continues to enjoy the second lowest food costs of all OECD members. So there's, there's a, you can see the problem here. Uh, farmers are a huge important part of our economy, yet the, uh, as a result of the changes uh, that, that came about in the late 1980s, early 1990s, our uh, way of supporting agriculture has um, basically uh, been cut dramatically. The other issues that we're facing uh, are uh, issues of market concentration. Um, there's a, a, a really good example. Um, we'll talk about a few of them, but one of them is, is milk. We used to have lots of small cooperatives. Uh, we now have Parma, Lad, and Saputo that control 80% of the processing. Uh, butter oil sugar blends have replaced um, whole milk and ice cream, so it's very hard to get real ice cream anymore unless you go to an artisanal dairy. Uh, we almost lost the cheese market, which is a third of the milk produced in Canada, to um, milk protein concentrates. Uh, luckily, we were able to stop that one. If it wasn't for supply management, dairy farmers would be in the same plight as their counterparts in the United States. Uh, the beef industry, you know, prior to the 1980s, well, I remember, I was in Ottawa then. Um, we had a, an agreement to take boxed beef from South America. And uh, we had a, a quota that we were going to take so much of this boxed beef to help out the producers. And uh, the United States took exactly their level, not one 
not one shank more. And in Canada, because the, whole, the, the wholesalers knew exactly when to put in the call, when there wouldn't be a supply in the, in the chain, let's say it was always Tuesday mornings, they got supplemental permits. And so Canada imported twice the amount of box beef as we were required to. And um, as a result, we wound up displacing our own beef market and creating an international uh, movement of beef back and forth in the United States. BSC um, was an absolute abomination that happened with BSC. We had a, we had a perfectly legitimate position to take right from the beginning would have been 211 days of arbitration. We didn't take it, Ottawa didn't take it, and it was the producers who paid that one um, and still pay with higher costs for specified risk materials. I just wanted to put this up because we were talking about um, JBS this morning, and I'm not going to go through a lot of this, but there were hearings in uh, May 2009, U.S. Senate hearings into this Five Rivers Ranch, which is a, which is a, um, Texas, Colorado, Idaho, Kansas, and Oklahoma uh, joint venture um, with 815,000 head capacity, slaughtering 2 million head a year. And it prompted Senate hearings. And I just, uh, what I really like is the, is the comment by this uh, Randy Stevenson, who's a farmer from Wheatland, Wyoming. The deal will basically make us tenant farmers on our own land with take it or leave it bids. The ability to vertically integrate by allowing more consolidation amongst packers and allowing them to have large feedlots like Five Rivers is economic waterboarding. Now, at the time that I was doing the research for this, packer ownership of cattle was not allowed in the United States. And then here, I think 50% of the cattle are owned by the packers and that's going to go up. Um, how, how? How, when penalties for overweight, does a producer ever manage to sell in an equitable market to a packer? How? This is what I want from my, oh, I'll take mine. Well, I'll hold a little, but don't hold it too long. You're going to get penalized. This is ridiculous. And there should be a, packers should not be allowed to own cattle. This is not a Canadian pig. This is true. This is a Cuban pig. But the hog industry is another disaster. It was a right-wing think tank solution, and it's been a disaster for farmers and communities. Uh, the Canadian Wheat Board, we all know about that. The professionals don't disagree. And what I find remarkable is um, I am uh, m more than happy to always defer to farmers in their wisdom. But in the case of a policy instrument like the Canadian Wheat Board, when you have professionals standing up, agrologists standing up and saying this is terrible public policy. This board gives premiums of $35 to $40 a ton on price and transportation. This is driven by big grain companies who want access to our good wheat to be able to upgrade their crappy wheat and get rid of the competitors so that everybody's boats except ours are floated is, is outrageous. And Joe Blow, who lives by the border, who says no one's going to tell me who to sell my wheat to, his opinion and my opinion are considered the same and that's ridiculous. On a public policy level, that's ridiculous. Sorry, I totally defer to farmers except on this one. Because there weren't really, there wasn't really the big, and the public thought, well, you know, maybe there's a disagreement. There wasn't the disagreement. There was a small group of farmers who had a particular ideological position, and we are all gone down the tubes with them. And it was an illegal acts by government, and um, I have never in my life seen as an agrologist anything as tragic as what happened to the wheat board. And this morning we talked about $50 million cuts to the Canadian Grain Commission. This is a very scary slope. Supply management. This is my, my friends uh, in Ontario who've been working on a volunteer project on dairy in Cuba with me. These are their five kids. He milks 55 cows. I think they're probably up to 60 now. Every one of these kids went to university. There's a doctor, a pharmacist, two farmers, and a person in the agribusiness. Uh, because he got a fair price for his land, for his for his milk, and he is a good farmer. If you look at what's so, we were announced that we were going into the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, maybe a year ago, and all of a sudden, all these uh, globalization gurus came out of the woodwork, um, led by Martha Hall Finley. Uh, basically, castigating supply management with all sorts of nonsense. She said. Canadians are forced to pay almost three times as much for four liters of whole milk as Americans, $1.50 more a liter. What she did, very briefly, is the American stat space um, picked up the cost of a, what, one of those three bag 
uh, it's, it's actually four liters of milk. The Canadian statistical base picked up one liter. 80% of our milk is sold in those three bag, uh, three bag bags. Uh, so she just said, okay, one liter, we'll just multiply that by four. Completely different pricing for the one liter container and the bag container. That's why 80% of our milk is bought in bags. The actual difference, instead of $1.50 a liter, was 15 cents a liter. And U.S. Uh, dairy producers get a 30 cent a liter subsidy for their milk. That's why when the fiscal cliff was approaching and everyone's going, oh, milk prices are going to go up in the United States because they were going to lose their, their subsidy. 4% of the dairy producers produce 52% of the milk in the United States. 4% produce 52%. And 40% of farms milk over 1,000 cows a day. Martha Hall Finley's um, statement was blatantly partisan. She actually said in her report, she, the, last, the last half of her report was how politicians shouldn't worry about taking on this issue because, quote, there are few, if any, ridings where dairy votes could plausibly swing elections. Now, what kind of a position? I mean, do we say in healthcare, there's only so many doctors in this riding, so let's just you know, forget about worrying about cuts to healthcare because you're not gonna get unelected because of it. It's ridiculous, but that was the position. And we need, you know, we need solidarity on these issues. The, the fact that we we're, we're, seem to be brought into this one-size-fits-all trade policy position is ridiculous. There's no reason why we cannot defend supply management for our milk and feather industries and look at trade for our export industries. There's no reason at all why we have to have those two exactly the same. This is not sustainable. So what is the effect on farm incomes? Let's look. Uh, so this is total net farm income, and all of the time it's from 71 to 2011. This is uh, adjusted for inflation. This is uh, total farm cash receipts, operating expenses, debt, but watch what happens now. The top line is debt. The bottom line is income. The green line is cash receipts, and the blue line is operating expenses. That shows a little bit about the concentration on the supply side, that those lines follow each other so closely. Look at what's happened to debt. This is when things started to go wrong. And look at what's happened since then. I call that Jaws, Jaws of the Crocodile, and that is completely unsustainable. And this. This story has to be explained. Here's, I knew you'd want to know, this is Alberta. <laughs> Not much different. And this is in actual fact from BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia. I do have Newfoundland, I just didn't throw it up there. This situation is the same right across Canada. It's absolutely outrageous. Um, you know, to think that we have a government that we're paying our taxes for to look after our communities that are treating our farmers like this is, uh, is, I'm rarely speechless, but this makes me speechless. So farm debt. In 1970, for every dollar in their pocket, at the end of the day, farmers carried 340 in debt. By the 1980s, this had gone to 742. By the 90s, this had gone to 10, 1047. 2000 to 2010, debt rose to a staggering 2325, a sevenfold increase over 1970 levels. This is not sustainable. Elephant in the room. How many people have heard here about <coughs> foreign investment funds coming in and buying up farmland? Just raise your hands. Thank you. I did an article for uh, Ontario Farmer that, I, that appeared on their front page. Um, of their business section uh, that looked into this. And this, these are from, I think, 2010 statistics. The World Bank reported that um, in 2009, there was a tenfold increase in the large-scale holdings that changed hands over the average for the previous uh, 1998 to 2008. It was 4 million a hectare. And in 2009, it was 45, 45 million hectares. Huge increase in land holdings changing hands. 
There, are, there is $100 billion in global capital funds, 120 funds only for the purchase of farmland. There are a number of, uh, there are a number of areas where uh, farmland is being sought. Um, first of all, who's buying it? Uh, Spain, Switzerland, China, Egypt, Iran. Um, a lot of it is being bought by, um, by governments that want to be able to provide food security to their people, that they don't have the land to do it. It's also being bought up as, um, as, uh, uh, for, for use conversion from food crops to oil crops to energy crops. And it's also being bought up because it's realized it's a good investment. Food is going to be necessary no matter what else happens. And so putting money into food is probably better at this point than putting it into asset-backed commercial paper. The Gulf states, China, Japan, pretty much everybody is in this game. And the target, now the target was Canada and Australia, but with the ev weather events in Australia, Australia has fallen off the map. Um, the land costs in 2010 Canadian prairies um, per hectare, about 2,000 USD compared to 17,000 in England and 3,400 in Australia. Here's the breakout of farmland across the globe. Um, you can see Canada prairies right there, uh, just above Russia and Ukraine. So when you look at where we are strategically on the globe, when we look at our transportation systems, when you look at the good government, um, lack of... <laughs> Lack of, um, of, uh, of uh, domestic strife, Canada is where these funds are looking to buy. And um, there again is the international farmland, the prices comparison. Um, and a little bit about some of the Canadian funds, Assiniboia Capital, Ag, Cap, Ag, Ag Capital Partners, Walton International. Um, Walton International looks at development ready farmland surrounding Canadian cities, so we know what they're really all about. Um, the next big issue is harmonization, and we took to, talked a little bit about that this morning. Um, not these beautiful ladies, uh, but in fact the um, dumbing down of regulatory standards and inspection standards to come up with a, uh, a global standard for these things. And you can look at the CFIA. We were talking about crop registration this morning. Um, CFMA this morning, Lynn mentioned research funding again. This is a question of capital calling the shots on sectors, policy sectors that are very important to agriculture. So how do we turn this around? Wild Rose Agricultural Producers is dead right on this one. We have to get rid of the silos that separate us as a farm community. Absolutely, fundamentally the first thing that has to happen. Um, to, for general farm organizations like um, RAP and CFA and, and all of the other provincial organizations have to become a force in public discussions. Right now we have commodity groups against commodity groups. We have organic against non-organic. We have GMO versus non-GMO. We have small scale versus large scale. We have city versus country. We have all of these factions that are dis diluting our voice. And this is a perfect storm for a government to simply drive right through the sector and uh, have their way with it. Uh, the implications for farmers, these silos, it gives a loss of voice, and uh, we just set ourselves up for policy abuse. This is absolutely critical. This is the number one thing that has to happen. Um, we need to leverage the consumer focus on food. Uh, this was a statement by the UN Environment Secretary at a conference in Oxford in 2010, and I, I really like it. Um, said, food security is as important to this country's future well-being and the world's as is energy security. We need to produce more food. We need to do it sustainably. And we need to make sure that what we eat safeguards our health. Wouldn't it be nice to have that kind of a statement come from Ottawa? I was thinking this morning, this is just something I threw in a few minutes ago. We need to have information campaigns that are creative and dramatic, right? I'm, I'm thinking 
I'm going home tomorrow, and, and I'm not sure whether the Idle No More will be, it's a national day of protest tomorrow, will be causing any disruptions on the roads. And so it's on my mind. And, and as I was sitting thinking about what I was going to talk to you about, I thought, you know, we really need to explain to the consumer what would happen if cannabis farmers disappear. You know, let's do a little study. Let's look at, let's do some projections and say if we get rid of agriculture in Canada or if it's no longer in independent hands, what is this going to mean to the Canadian consumer? We have to get this message across. Um, to just give you an idea of how primed the consumer is for this, this is uh, something interesting, I think. It's a National Restaurant Survey, it's an American survey, um, 2010 chef survey of 1,800 professional chefs in over 200 culinary items. And what they asked them was, what are the hot trends on menus? And the 1, 2, 3, 10, and 12 were locally grown produce, locally sourced meats and seafoods, sustainability, sustainable seafood, and organic produce. You might have thought organic would be the top, but it isn't. But it just gives you a real sense of what that consumer is looking for. So, you know, everybody's ready to embrace a vision that's going to give, deliver these sorts of, of uh, benefits. And you need to, to get going on that. So this greed gene thing, I think, is wrong. I think, and I think that most farmers would agree, when you look at the development of the Canadian West, and you look at the farm communities and cooperation, when you look at, at Hay East and, and all those sorts of things, I think we have an intrinsic need to cooperate and to support one another. These little ducks um, are outside my house in uh, the winter time. And remarkably, they keep assembling and reassembling themselves in these little lines. And they swim forward. And then when they get into the shore, they fish. Right? And, and, and there's, uh, I don't know, hundreds, 500 of them. And they, they, they snake around. It's like watching one of those little things. And they just come back in, and they are cooperating. I think we have an instinct to cooperate. I think we're born with a sense to cooperate. I don't think that greed is our basic human value. I think cooperation is. And, you know, 2012 was the International Year of Cooperatives. I and others, uh, Paul was with me, were in Quebec City. There were 2,800 delegates. Canada had two international conferences back to back. One was Imagine 2012, the other was the Quebec International Summit of Co-ops. Imagine 2012 was a conference of economists, and then the other conference was the larger, broader conference. There were 2,800 delegates from over 100 countries represented talking about the advantages and benefits of cooperation and how looking at what is happening in our world on an economic level, it's really time to go back to the future with cooperatives. Um, I keep saying the light at the end of the tunnel really can be the end of the tunnel if we get this one right. And this is going to launch a decade of cooperation. In terms of cooperatives, just a couple of little comments. Um, you know, when, when a private sector firm fails, no one turns around and, and blames capitalism, right? But when a co-op fails, there's a lot of people who go, ah, well, you know, those co-ops don't really always work. And that, has to, that myth has to be completely dispelled. Um, Dairyland is a good case in point. And, um, this uh, is a slide from a presentation I made to National Farmers Union um, in my St. Mary's work and probably part of my graduate thesis. We'll be looking at um, why some large co-ops have failed and what the issues were behind it. And, and so the easy way to explain this analysis, there's a, there's a tool that was developed by a forensic cooperative accountant in New Zealand who's one of my profs. And uh, it's got the, a very kludgy name of operating cash flow after interest and dividends analysis. But, but what it does is it, um, it produces one of four pictures of the health of that co-op. And uh, I say, if you went to your doctor 
I mean, when people look at financial statements, it's not just farmers, anyone, look at, the, look at 2008. People look at financial statements, they don't really know what they're seeing. And there's all sorts of ways, as you heard from the accountant this morning, to put things off in the back corner where they're not apparent. And everything looks really good on Friday, and on Monday, all of a sudden, you're packing your bags. <clears throat> if you went to your doctor, and uh, she said, well, you've got a hand over here and a hand over there. You've got a foot there and a foot there. Nothing seems too large. Nothing seems too small. You're healthy. You'd get another doctor, but that's what we do with financial statements. So we need a way to easily, transparently let producers, members know, this works for non-co-ops as well, but I'm interested in co-ops, um, <clears throat> know exactly what's happening. And, and in the case of Dairyland, and as I said, it produces four pictures, and they're very clear. It's either doing very well, it's uh, a little bit in trouble, it's really in trouble, or it's almost dead. And <clears throat> if I took Dairyland's financial statements from 1981 to 2000, <clears throat> and um, 2001 almost, half a year, and uh, ran them through this analysis. And if this had been on the front page of their annual statements, they would have known four years earlier that they were heading for the cliff. This had nothing to do with co-op management. It had to do with bad decision-making by management and expansion and debt and uh, unsustainable business practices. But the problem is, <clears throat> even on the board level, they had a really strong CEO. They used to have a strong board chair, but when they merged, the strong board chair went out, weak board chair came in, the CEO took over. And I had one of the members of the board come to me and say, what am I going to do? And he took, we did a little workshop on it. No matter what he said, he was snowed by the executive management team who just sort of went, oh, no, no, you don't understand, and this and that and the other thing. If they'd had this simple analysis, which is very deep analysis, it's like a stethoscope. It's like a blood pressure cuff. It tells you what's going on. They could have said, look, I don't care what you say. This is a problem. We need outside people in here to look at what's happening. Similarly, the members coming to a meeting, whoa. Uh, there's something wrong here, and we know it. It gives members and directors ownership of information that can't be refuted that says we're in trouble. And uh, if this had been, as I said, done with Dairyland, we would still, that 100-year-old cooperative would still be around. Uh, this is uh, the presentation I made. This is on my website. So you can go and look at it if you're interested. Um, Paul says everybody's eyes glaze over when you talk about that. So <laughs> but it's really a, it's a very important tool. Um, and uh, my um, January column in Western Dairy Farmer has all the information on this as well. And the other thing that co-ops need is poison pills, and we need to do some development on that so that uh, at the end of the day, people just don't, we want to take all our money and leave as opposed to being able to, uh, in other words, um, capitalize the assets of the co-op and take that out rather than what's, what's, uh, what they have been put in. Um, you, and I'm sorry, I should have had cooperators and a few others on here, but I was just looking at the ag co-ops. Um, you need to get to know the co-op champions on your block. Uh, very successful co-ops out there. Agripour, Mondragon, Emilia Romagna, Quebec. Um, SAOS is a century old, highly successful Scottish farm co-op and I know exactly the person to, you should bring over here to talk to a farm group. Bob Ewell would do a wonderful job explaining to you just how they run their ship, which is tight and efficient. Um, we need to recognize and pay for stewardship. Uh, farmers in good farm practices put all sorts of goodies on the public table that aren't paid for when that grain or those eggs or those vegetables are paid for by the consumers and we need to pay for them. This is the green box that Dunkel was talking about. This is how you support agriculture without changing farm decision making. You support the benefits that are put on the table to riparian habitat, wetlands and wildlife, endangered species, protected uh, zones, etc., etc., because these are all very great benefits from agriculture that will be gone. You need to strengthen relationships with local government. I still think local government is your most accessible and direct government, and um, if you can make uh, strong connections and get local government on your side, 
Local governments meet uh, together once a year in, in um, plenary municipalities and they can take lead leadership on issues. You can go and speak to them and get, uh, I think, a good audience for change. I think, you know, bullshit is an agricultural term and as an agrologist I'm licensed to say bullshit when I see it and you need to call bullshit when you see it too. You know, I've heard, um, oh well, farmers are only three or five percent of the population, so it's hard to come up with the money, da 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 da. Doesn't work with teachers, doctors, why should it work with farmers? Um, difficult for government to invest more than the size of the industry justifies, well, that's just an idiot and you've got to get him or her out of office and get the right person in there who understands what they're there for. Um, farmers need to undergo transformational change. Farmers need to be more competitive. No. Policymakers need to understand what their responsibility is to me and to everybody else in this country and look after your interests. You need to engage as much as possible with young farmers. I really like the, uh, the FCC, uh, where is it? Oh, maybe it's, it may had it up, but the, yeah, yeah, uh, really some really good stuff there. Um, looking at apprenticeship co-ops, how do young people, if they haven't, you know, in, at UBC, seven out of 10 students coming out of land and food systems want to farm. They want to grow food for a living, very different from when I went there. And um, they don't have, a, if they haven't come from a farm, they don't really have an ability to do this. And they can't really be sent out to be an apprentice because if somebody can't, you know, fix a pump or start a tractor, they're, they're more cost than they are help uh, having them around. So we need to have areas where, you know, young people are given 10 hectares of land for two years and some support and some mentoring to learn how to farm and then give them a, 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 a good ride when they go out in terms of low interest rates to be able to start working with outstanding young farmers and 4-H. Maybe um, consider a youth board for Wild Rose that uh, draws young people up. Maybe you already have this, I don't know, but um, I think that it's very important. To, I think uh, prohibiting the foreign buy-up of Canadian farmland is important, and I think this is a matter of education. I think this is happening completely quietly. You know, if I, uh, if I suddenly uh, have a new pickup truck in the driveway, or, or suddenly I've, uh, I'm taking a Caribbean vacation, you know, somebody figures, oh well, you know, Uncle Jacob maybe died and left them some money. Nobody knows when this land is being bought up. It's happening right under the radar, and we have to figure out what to do about this, because it's very serious. Um, and in the end, it just comes down to speaking with one voice. All of these issues need to come out, and one voice will make it happen. Um, this conference calls on us to share a vision for the future. Um, the challenge is now to deliver that vision. Um, if those who control capital control you, we are all in big trouble. In fact, we're lost. You produce food. That's a noble and respected thing to do. You need to take back that respect, because you certainly have it from me. So I hope I've given you some food for thought. And I think I'm right on, bang on, 45 minutes, yay. <laughs> so thank you very much for your kind attention.